and then we can get underway. Excellent. Great. Well, welcome everybody to uh, another of our panels today at the Alt City Summit. Um, I'm just going to go through our uh, set of slides that we have here, um, and obviously give a big thank you to uh, to Pebblepad, I should say there, who are our sponsors for today's session. And without uh, Pebblepad, today's session would probably not happen. So big thank you to them. Um, I was going to just double check. We were having a quick conversation in the chat about um, notifications and things. So they can be found in the access panel. In the bottom right hand corner, there is a little purple chevron. If you click that, it will give you access to chat and also access to the settings cog that you can see there on the screen um in towards the bottom right hand corner and then if you click on that that would allow you to go in and play with the settings so that you can take off all the bings and bongs that happen and might start to annoy you um and also um we are in the large settings of blackboard collaborate so that you only got your um chat facility not the microphone um, at the moment but we may have time for questions later on and uh, we can give you the microphone if you need it uh, you can also raise your hand um, as martin says on that slide there okie dokie um, so i'm hoping that by now you will all be fully au fait with blackboard collaborate and you're able to use the uh, the chat but if you do have any problems then please do um, let us know we also have a help desk function which you can email um, and I shall just pop that on the slide for you. Thanks again to Pebble Pad. There we go. Oh, and there's, there we go. I didn't expect that then. That surprised me. <laughs> <laughs> More added, added bonus for you there from Pebble Pad. Great. Okay. I'm going to hand over very shortly to um, our speakers today. Um, and we have uh, David up first with Debbie, and then we hand over to Leo and Verena. So I'm just going to close my slides down now, Debbie, and hand over to you and David. Thank you. Just double check in case there's anything else sneaking on here that I've said. There we go. Oh, yes, I've sort of said that. That's the help. Great. Okay, I'll close that one down and I'll hand over to you. Thanks, then. So, Lovely. Um, Welcome, welcome everybody to our session this afternoon and um, in the way of a slow gentle introduction my name is David and I'm joined this afternoon with Debbie uh, and there's a third colleague Andrew who, who's not with us uh, today uh, but today we're going to be talking about academic advising um, and this all comes from our search for the meaningful use of data to help uh, student learning so it's part of our broader learning analytics work and in this presentation, we're looking wholly about our efforts to, to take uh, academic advising online uh, to help student learning. So that's where we come from as uh, in terms of this presentation. So, so in terms of uh, setting the scene, so we, we think of academic advising as a staff student uh, process, uh, which has the aim of, of helping students with their academic development and achievement, uh, but also um, their pastoral uh, support as well. Um, and it's tend to be viewed very positively by, by students uh, and staff in recent surveys, there's one by Chan here, uh, but the results uh, are variable, um, for example, based on the attitude of the advisor. I don't know if it's the same in your institution, but I know where, where I work, uh, academic staff have various views of uh, academic advising which has an impact on how effective their sessions are. We'll come back to that in a moment. So it's just raining very heavily outside my window at the moment, which is why the background noise might be coming from. So we've got some questions for you today. Uh, we've got six questions for you. Um, and what we'd like to do is for you to ask the question and then for you to put the answers as you go through in the chat if, you, if you'd like to. And so my first question is a very good question, is what factors uh, influence academic advising at your institution. So what sort of things uh, affect academic advising where, where you work? That's our first question. 
interestingly at our institution um, when it was a bit more informal it seemed to work better than when we had a huge central very formal policy so that's just a, an interesting thing just to to kick in there if anybody else has got any you know do you have academic advising policies people We've got some greeting going on at the moment. Okay, well, in which case, let's move on quickly. And if you have a thought about that, please do add, please do add, um, add little little messages in the chat, and we can revisit them. So let's move on. Okay. So, oops, some of the factors which we normally uh, see reported uh, when we look at influencing factors are the frequency of the interaction between staff and students. So, how many times a semester might you normally uh, get together? But crucially for students is, is the influence they perceive in these sessions on their own development uh, with the view that if students perceive more benefit, then they're more likely to be uh, engaged. Uh, and the relevance of information, this is how beneficial again students see the information they're getting back from their, their staff members uh, in terms of the, the questions that they raise. That's linked obviously to acad the advisor uh, knowledge. Uh, and we, we talked briefly before about the advisor attitude. Uh, that they bring to the, the whole session and therefore the quality of the relationship between the, the two parties um, here. Uh, going to the right hand side we've got clarity about what the academic advising process is actually there uh, to do. So some see um, perhaps a lack of clarity from a student perspective in terms of what uh, the process is there to do. Uh, is it for academic only? What things can they raise? What about confidentiality? Um, very personal questions, are those permissible? So clarity of process is important and that affects the advisee's perspective uh, on the whole process and therefore that links to their participation. Uh, the size of groups is another factor. Uh, many institutions seem to have some live group sessions, others have smaller or individual sessions. Uh, how that is mediated, whether it's face-to-face -face or online, and then how much time is spent in, in that process. Are all um, factors which seem to influence uh, how students and staff feel about the academic advising uh, in institutional uh, process. So let's look at some of the... Okay. So move to question number two here then. So this is an easy uh, question to ask you. So on a scale of one, which is low, or ten, which is high, how important is academic advising at your institution? So how important is it for, for your institution? Just looking at Lee's comment there, Lee is saying that um, one of the problems with standardization is that it takes out some of the, the, the soul out of, of that interaction. That's the personality um, and the difference that people bring to it is a key thing that you may lose from, that, from standardization. So Anne-Marie here is just saying it's a 10. We've got Chris with an eight, Gavin with a seven. So we're dropping down here slowly. Um, <laughs> so Chris's uh, result is, is a score of two, but they're for academics. So academics perhaps don't see it as importantly as, as perhaps students do. And it's an Im important differentiation to, uh, to draw. Actually, that's a very interesting point. Uh -huh. I think quite often it's very high in kind of corporate communications and things like that. And then I think kind of some of these high scores or low scores are really kind of reflecting the nuances and what it's actually like when we're trying to do it. Hmm. Yes, there's certainly a difference between the, the policy and the practice sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you for that. We will uh, move on. Uh, so one question I'd like to ask you very quickly is about the variability in the process in your institution. Uh, so just very quickly, again, on from low variability to high variability, how much difference is there between the different schools or faculties or parts of the institution in terms of how academic advising is uh, done? Again, from my experience in my institution, there's quite a bit of variability. We do have a policy, uh, but then that there's some freedom about how individual academics uh, enact that policy. What if it's the same for uh, for yourselves? Now, have any views on on that? So, 
So Anne Marie, thank you. Talking about uh, an eight, so high degree of variability. Um, different faculties taking their own uh, mm. their own view, and perhaps as Lee says, over time, uh, variability might increase uh, where there's less central con control. Okay, I'm going to crunch the time, so I'm going to move on. So when we were looking at this uh, issue at our institution. Uh, we wanted to re record these interactions between academic advisors and students. I wanted to use our VLE uh, as being a core uh, central repository with all the necessary um, privacy and security uh, requirements already fulfilled. But we found that was quite difficult to do uh, in our VLE. So we, we set about a little case study, a department of 21 academic advisors, about 500 uh, games and music students. Uh, we were looking at interactions twice per semester uh, with more group sessions for first and second year and then mostly one-to-one -one sessions for our final year students. Um, and one thing we did as part of our standardization process was to put in agendas for all sessions so all staff are encouraged to follow the same process uh, for their sessions. And here's an example of an introduction to one session that we, uh, that we used. So this is for a first year, a level four induction. This is in their induction week. So it's all about access to Unix. Uh, do they have logins, door codes, all those things. And these are the first four things that we are staff to go through. So it's all about introducing themselves, getting students to introduce themselves, clarifying the role of AAs, and then checking a class list in terms of uh, attendance. Uh, so that was how we would structure, and all our sessions uh, for first and second years would be structured in a similar, a similar way. So fourth question out of six for you then, what do you think of having these agenda for staff for every session that they do to guide them? Do you think that's a useful thing to uh, to do? So Lee's saying, oh, probably absolutely, but it's a different question. Actually, Chris has raised an important question here about uh, whether uh, subject matter expertise automatically uh, engenders someone to be a good mentor or advisor. Obviously, that there's no direct correlation between the, the two. Certainly, where I work, we have um, development sessions for academic advisors uh, so that they're helped to become good mentors, uh, to know where to go for information when they need it, and who else they can call in uh, to help. Uh, with their interactions. Good point, Anne Marie. It's the students as well. We're coming on to that. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're coming on to the students in a moment. Uh, so, in terms of recording these interactions, we start off by only really recording attendance. So, do the student turn up for it or, or not? And we started in, in the last academic year a pilot uh, to try and explore how we could give better information uh, to both staff uh, and students. And so that's what this presentation about is, is a pilot and what we learned along the, along the way. Um, so we were faced with the potential for collecting lots of information from students, but some of it's not viable to collect in the time available. So what metrics do you think or information would you think would be useful to capture? Uh, for staff and students uh, from these types of interactions. So what, what do you currently capture in your institutions? So I'm really just raised a question that in, a, in a mentoring relationship, the, the expectation is that the mentee uh, is doing a fair bit of work. That, that's true. I think both sides have a high workload to make these relationships uh, effective uh, for both. So, so Chris says attendance is, is a key thing. Totally agree with that. Um, uh, Sarah, academic knowledge gaps. So, so that would be useful to work out what information students need and how that can be provided. So Lee's point is a, is a very valuable one about flagging up whether further support uh, is needed and we'll, we'll, we'll address that in just a moment. Uh, Debbie's saying uh, boundaries, in, that's probably in terms of the overall relationship, what, what can and uh, can't be discussed um, within these um, uh, sessions. An action plan, so, so Sue, I like, like your action plan. 
And that's one of the things we wanted to do is, is to help students to set themselves some goals for the future. Uh, and we could, through the ongoing relationship that staff have with students, we have the ability to support students to achieve those goals and also to uh, sort of track how they're doing. So that was a really important thing uh, for us as well, the action plan. And I'll explain that uh, in a moment. Uh, so Chris mentioned attendance. Uh, so we measure in this pilot uh, student attendance and then we feed it back to, to students and to staff how students are doing. So this is a part of a, a feedback form that a student would receive every three weeks uh, through the VLE showing, showing their attendance. So uh, it shows different labs and lectures as you see and then uh, whether they attended or not and an overall percentage and we had some rag rating red amber green uh, to help students uh, to understand the information if they weren't attending very well then perhaps they would have a red status or an amber or, or green as this one has for a high attendance so we would give the students this information on a three-weekly basis I would also give staff the same information so they can see when they meet with their uh, tutees how attendance is being um, engaged with uh, from the different students. So that's one aspect of the information we fed back. And the second one was about uh, achievement so far. So we know students have access to all their uh, records through their VLEs, uh, but here we summarise it on, on one piece of paper. So you can see in semester one, this person took three units. Uh, the two assessment parts for each unit. You can see their grades, the unit marks, uh, and their outcomes, pass or fail. And it's purely a student focused view here. So not comparing them to their peers. We're just saying this is how you did. And the color coding helps you to quickly visualize this and see how the student is doing. So again, we would feed this back to, to students in this format and also give the academic advisor the same information uh, so that when they're talking to the student about their, say, semester one activities, they have a, a record of their attendance, but also their achievement as a basis for their, their discussion. Um, what we then wanted to do was to capture, as Sue mentioned earlier, uh, students' goals and aspirations, and for them to set themselves some academic targets that went beyond just the semester units that they were taking. Uh, so we created this form. We couldn't use our VLE for this. We tried and failed. And so in the end, we used um, the JISC online uh, survey to do it. So you can see here, students are filling out their identification. We need to know who they are so we can record their attendance. We need to know who their academic advisor is so we can feed it back to their academic advisor and the date. And then we asked them to set themselves uh, some some smart uh, goals, three goals, which we'd record, we'd feed back to them, and then we might come back to them in six months time to see how well they're doing and how the academic could support them in that. Uh, so it's quite a quick form to fill in. We also ask them how they're doing on a scale of one to 10. And then uh, as someone mentioned before, we asked them, is there anything else that we need to pick up with them? Is there anything else they want to raise or is concern? And then, at the bottom, there's a section saying, is there any further help needed by other people? So by student services, their program leader, that's PL, or to the deputy head department. So this is to any further action that's needed. So we, so we have somewhere to track it and it's not lost. So let's move on a bit faster. One of the problems we had with academic advising in this pilot was engagement. Uh, four at the bottom is our first years, five is our second years. And this is a percentage uh, graph. So we can see that about a quarter of our first years engaged and, and probably half that number for level five. So engagement in the process is a, a key, key issue. And we'll come back to that in a moment or two. But those that did engage, um, th these are the word frequency of the goals that they set. You can see they're using words like aim, achieve, uh, attend, um, improve, uh, start, skills, study. So some very positive words that they're starting to, to use when they consider what they're trying to achieve from their academic time at uh, university. Th these next two examples come from uh, some first year students. So this was probably three months into their university course. Uh, I've taken away their name, but you can see their target here, say for the first one, 
it is really good that they're, they're saying I want to make some side projects uh, to improve their skills. Their target two is about uh, establishing a certain style that they want to pursue. And target three is about research, more about my field and opportunities available to me so they can prepare for placement. So really good positive goals. And by setting them, I think that they can hopefully achieve them. And the academic advisor being aware of them can also help them to, to achieve that. So the AA might have some links that they can put them in touch with to really help them to develop their networking um, opportunities and help them to achieve a uh, placement in their in their third year. So those that engage we found have some really good um, goals that they set that we could then help them to uh, to achieve. This is just a quick graph to show uh, information about how much effort people are putting into their studies. The, the graph on the left uh, is level four, that's first years. So they had an average of about seven, so a fair bit of effort. We can see by uh, second year, they're putting a lot more effort into their studies based on how they report it. Uh, so what we aimed in this pilot was to have as much of this information in our VLE as possible uh, to make it as, as controlled and as seamless as we could. Um, but during the pilot, we found that wasn't really uh, possible. And what we needed to do was we created a separate uh, set of signing sheets which use an access database to print these sheets off, to scan them back in, and then feed that data back into the VLE, because we couldn't do that effectively and seamlessly within the VLE. So that was one slight problem we had. And the second one was we had to use uh, the GIST online forms I mentioned, uh, which then well, the data was extracted from there into an R program to manipulate it, um, reformat it as PDF, and then to feed that back into the VLE so it could be seen by students and, and by staff. So a really not very um, streamlined process uh, to try and achieve our goals. So conclusions, uh, positive side, we found we had a more uh, consistent approach uh, from staff, given our, our agendas that we gave staff to guide them what they should be covering. So therefore students get a more consistent approach which is not uh, mediated by staff experience or engagement in the process themselves. By feeding back grades and attendance we, we will have much better information going back to students in a, a summarised form and also for the first time academic staff could see clearly and easily how students were performing and that was a great basis for them uh, and for their discussion. There was the potential, uh, we thought, to promote reflection. So by setting these goals, say in this first session, as we saw just now, we were planning the second session to get students to reflect on how well those goals are doing. So uh, how much progress are they making? What barriers do they have? And what can we do to, to help overcome that? So that the great potential there to help people uh, to reflect more and to therefore gain more from their studies, potentially. Um, we did find engaged students uh, engaged well uh, and similarly on the negative side uh, the downside of that was that people who perhaps might benefit from this sort of process um, were not really engaged and therefore we sort of lost them from, from the picture. Other downsides we found from our pilot uh, was that our VLE uh, couldn't cope with this. A lot of our VLE is focused on units and so this uh, trans unit across three years type process wasn't really well supported which is why we needed to go to third party tools and, uh, and bespoke, bespoke work. But that meant, and this is a key problem for us with this solution, was that it was not scalable in any way. So it could work for one department with a lot of um, support, but it wasn't scalable across 20 times that number of uh, departments. And we're thinking about engagement. And one of the thoughts we had was that we needed to, to demonstrate that the benefits of academic advising to students to increase their engagement to get them into the process uh, because the feeling from staff who interviewed afterwards was that they felt the process was, was better than it had been in the past but we need to engage students more uh, in, in that and demonstrate uh, why engagement is of benefit to, to them to bring them in. So uh, I've got one or two moments. This is my last side of questions uh, 
for, for you. So we described our experiences of this pilot and the pros and cons. Uh, so a couple of questions here to finish off before we run out of time. The first one being, does academic advising need to be taken online? Do you think there are benefits from recording uh, and reviewing what students have said? Uh, and if so, how can this be achieved in an effective way? With my parting questions there to you. Oh, Ada, can you say more about the big blue button and Jitsi? Sorry, I, I was looking for for my my hearings. Uh, well, we have a very very good experience using Moodle and integrating um, Big Blue Button and Jitsi. Uh, the students are very useful, uh, are very um, accustomed to use these tools. We are, you are, we've been using Big Blue Button for, I think, a couple of years already. And now that the, we integrated also Jitsi and the experience we have is has been really really cool they they uh, they use it and they i think uh, it's very um i how can i say it they are used to these tools i think <laughs> mm, okay Lots of people in the comments are talking about that they're being, being forced to be online, and that's why we will be um, obviously mediated by mm. Zoom and uh, and Teams. Um, but what I find in many institutions, it, there was no record of those interactions, and it's whether we need to record more about those interactions um, that we can use to help students uh, in the future. Mm. Yeah, it really is thinking about, you know, if we start to look at learner analytics, are we measuring what matters? I think that's po probably my con sort of concluding thoughts there. Yeah. That's a really good point, Karen. How do we, you know, how can you make those that are going to engage are going to engage, but we all know mm. the ones that are less likely to engage are the ones who aren't logging in and so on and so on. I guess we have to go back to the keynote and pull out some of the ideas from there. No, that's, uh, that, uh, that's true. Uh, we think that demonstrating more of the benefits and making clear what the academic advising process is can may, may be the way to bring some people in. But obviously, some students will, don't want to engage, and that's absolutely fine if they don't wish to. Uh, Anne Marie's point about um, measuring engagement uh, is not is a useful measure. We, we did some analysis of outcomes and engagement last year, and, and we did find a, a moderate positive correlation between, um, at that time, it was uh, on campus uh, engagement and outcomes. If we can see going forward how online engagement and outcomes are are linked if at all. So I'm getting the signs over running out of time here, so <laughs> bring that to, to a, a close. Uh, but thank you to everybody who ha has commented on that. Some really interesting uh, uh, feedback and comments on that. That's been really helpful that we can take forward. That was really, really good. Thanks ever so much, David. Thanks, David.